ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joanne Waller, and I am co-president of the League of Women Voters of Palos Verdes Peninsula. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Rancho Palos Verdes City Council Forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization of men and women. We believe in good government, citizen education, and citizen participation in all levels of the government. We never support or oppose political candidates or parties. We are divided into two wings. The first wing is the action wing, where we do studies, reach consensus, and then take action on that consensus. The second wing is the voter service wing, which is committed to providing unbiased information on all aspects of the election process. And as you can tell, this forum is part of the voter service wing. The League of Women Voters would like to thank the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and RPVTV for their cooperation in producing this forum. We would like to thank Nancy Marr, our voter service director and her committee for the work they did on this forum. And now, without further ado, I am going to turn the forum over to one of our best moderators, Linda Herman. Uh, good evening, everyone. I have to say that uh, Joanne took away some of what I was going to say, but I'm just delighted to welcome you to our candidate uh, forum today. Um, we've been around a long time, and um, one of the things we've always felt it important to do is to hold pre-election meetings and invite all candidates to speak, to collect and give out nonpartisan information on the candidates and on the issues, and conduct meetings such as this. Um, we are therefore pleased to present the following candidates seeking a position on the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. We have three candidates for two positions, avail uh, positions available for a, to two, uh, for a four year term. They are Brian Campbell, and they're not, I'm not, well, let me go in order here Anthony Mizetich, Brian Campbell, and Ken Dida. Um, each candidate has agreed to abide by the guidelines stipulated in the letter of our invitation. The format will be as follows. Each candidate will have a three-minute opening statement and then two minutes to respond to questions from the audience. Our timers, who are seated in the front row, Terry Arnish and Diana Halderman, will hold up a card indicating when your time is up. While we will try not to stop you in mid-sentence, we urge you and hope you'll be responsive to the, time, to the time limitations. I would ask that the audience, I would ask the audience that you remain as quiet as possible while the candidates are speaking so that everyone may hear. And please hold your applause until, all, until the forum has ended so that the candidates will have all the time possible for getting their points across. And as usual, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and unauthorized videos are not allowed. We are, we are videotaping this, this uh, forum, and it will be shown on TV, and I will give you the, the details about that at, at the conclusion of, our pres of the presentation. We will then open the forum, af after the opening statements, we will then open the forum to questions from the audience. Members of the audience are asked to submit questions on cards that I shall read on your behalf, and questions are open to all candidates. Ushers are at the ready. Uh, let's see, where's Judith? Was Judith is back there collecting questions. Um, she's at the ready to, with cards and pencils for you to write out your questions. So just let her know that you require a card and also when your question is ready to be picked up. Sorting of questions may occur. We have two of our, our league people here who you've already heard about <laughs> uh, sorting the questions. Um, and um, our goals in sorting are to, to cover the broadest range possible of subject matter, to make sure that all questions can be answered by all candidates, 
and to make sure that they are in the form of questions, not statements. Questions that are unclear, hostile, or of a personal nature will not be used. Those that fall in the same general area may be consolidated to allow us to cover as many topics as possible in the time allotted. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters of Palos Verdes. We will conclude our question and answer period at 8.50 if we fill up the entire time. And each candidate will then present a one minute closing statement. The order of opening statements uh, was determined by lot before we began and we will begin with a Pardon me, Anthony Mizitich. Linda, thank you, and League of Women Voters. Thank you. <laughs> now you can hear me. Linda, thank you, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having uh, inviting us to uh, speak tonight to you in this candidate's forum. I want to thank the citizens of Rancho Palos Verdes for allowing me the opportunity to serve on the City Council for the last four years. It's been a pleasure and an honor serving you. This election is about whether the city is better off today than it was four years ago. Our city has more transparency than it did four years ago. It has greater financial reserves than it did four years ago and is currently working on the largest infrastructure project in the city history, the San Ramon project. That was an election issue four years ago. That project is due to be completed next, February, next April. In the past four years, I brought zero-based budgeting principles to our city that have resulted in greater scrutiny of our city budget. I've helped forge closer relationship with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and Lomita Station. I've helped work to preserve open space and bring more transparency to RPV. All this is in an effort to make RPV a beautiful place for you all to live and work. I'm asking for your vote for another final four years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Campbell? Thank you, Linda. My name is Brian Campbell. I'm currently on the Rancho Palos Verde City Council. Prior to council, my involvement in the community started really at the street level. I got involved in my local homeowners association, neighborhood watch, got involved with that board. The more I learned about the city, the more interested I became in learning more. I volunteered then to be the liaison between RHOA and the Council of Homeowners Association, known by the acronym CHOA. Ultimately, I became a board member there and then served as president uh, for two years. I then also spent two years on the general plan update committee, which we're currently dealing with now in uh, portions on the council. While on council, I am very pleased to see the strides that we have made in transparency. I'm very pleased to see the uh, amount of work that has gone into maintaining our storm drain and streets and other infrastructure. I'm very excited uh, to also agree with Councilman Misitich that the San Ramon Canyon, I very distinctly remember in this room four years ago, it was a, a campaign issue and we all had different points of view as to how important it was. I've always felt it was important and I have been a big proponent of that and we are under construction and it's going to be done a lot quicker than most people think. I mean, probably by April of next year or so, perhaps a little bit sooner it'll be done. That literally will save the switchbacks on, on PV Drive East from any further erosion or risk of ultimately having to, having to be uh, replaced completely. I've really worked hard on expanding our relationship with the local sheriff's department. I come from a, uh, a family that's, uh, I've got an older brother that's a 30 year veteran of, uh, of police work. I spent a lot of time, I grew up uh, listening to him and, and being very comfortable in that environment. I think we can continue to expand transparency uh, because the more transparency we have, I think the more community involvement that we have and the more community involvement we have in our city, the greater the public trust will be in the local government. 
The, uh, the Ponta Vista project over on Western Avenue is an important issue I'm excited about working on going forward. We've got our, lo our largest homeowners association in the city, Rolling Hills Riviera, that is right across the street. It's almost 800 homes. What goes on just across that border in the city of LA from RPV on Western Avenue has a direct impact on our families, our communities, home values, etc. Uh, I come from a commercial real estate uh, background. I've got a unique uh, uh, amount of experience to be able to help our community address those issues. For the future, I am excited about implementing some of the banking policies uh, that we've got now where we bid them out periodically and continuing to work on more community involvement. And it's been a pleasure serving for the last four years. I'm excited about the next four years. And the good news is, at the end of this, is two of us are going to be elected, and I don't think the community can go wrong, uh, whichever two that they choose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dida. Good evening. I thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. I was privileged to be a part of Save Our Coastline Policy Committee, which orchestrated the incorporation of Rancho Palos Verdes. Save Our Coastline was the culmination of extensive work by the League of Women Voters to identify the threat of overdevelopment in the unincorporated area. Without their foresight, the effort would not have been undertaken and we would not be here today. I was also fortunate to be elected to the first city council serving three terms. The city council, with the aid of over 250 residents, developed the goals for the city. This resulted in our general plan. In 2002, I organized 210 residents to review, to review and update the goals report. The result was a confirmation of the original report, a testimony to its enduring validity. During my tenure on the first city council, I developed a performance-based sheriff's contract, which was subsequently adopted by all the contract cities in the state. I negotiated with the city of Rolling Hills and Rolling Hills Estates to take that a step further by implementing a regional sheriff's contract which improved performance and reduced the cost to all three cities. I also developed the legislation that created the Geologic Hazard Abatement District, which resulted in stopping the movement to an insignificant level in Abalone Cove and Klondike Canyon. After leaving the council in 1983 and throughout the intervening years, I continued to serve on various commissions and committees. Over time, the city has begun to drift away from its founding principles. I have identified 17 issues which I believe can be improved. They are available in the literature on the tables outside or on my website, kendida.com. I am happy to report that at last night's meeting, the council adopted a template which will bring into one place the comparison, compensation, pardon me, and benefits for each employee. This template is very similar to the one I have advocated for the past two years. It is a first step towards complete transparency in city operations. I leave you with one thought. A city that does not remember its origin, its history, and founding principles is like a tree without roots. It will not flourish. I believe I can encourage the council members to make some of the adjustments that would result in embracing all those founding principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dida. Uh, we have uh, our opening question, uh, the lead question, I, I will read that, but we have an opening question also, I think, from the audience, which is fairly similar. But our lead question asks, what is one major issue facing the city, and how do you suggest the council should address it? And the question from the audience is, what are, most, what are the most significant issues confronting the Rancho Palos Verdes, short-term and long-term? That's a lot. <laughs> for two minutes. Um, so perhaps we can divide that into short-term for two minutes and long-term for two minutes. Would that be better? Uh, maybe we'll take it that way. Um, and I think rather than going in a direct order, we'll start with you, Mr. Campbell. So we can start with the short term. Short term issues or short or, or issues. one issue? What are the most significant issues confronting RPV in the short term? In two minutes. 
Starting on the east side, I would say the Ponta Vista housing project. It is currently being proposed for 830 units. Uh, the, that is approximately four times what the original zoning was to give you an idea of what that is. Take a look at our, uh, take a look at the RPV side of Western Avenue and all those single family homes in that great neighborhood over in Rolling Hills Riviera. That's what was similar at the Navy housing uh, yard. So take that and multiply it times four and that's the sort of density that, uh, that we're talking about. I'm concerned about traffic. I'm concerned uh, uh, about a lot of different issues, including the loss of value of our own homes. The butane tanks on Gaffey Street, while not technically, well, not physically in Rancho Palos Verdes, RPV is 400 yards away. And the potential downside, if there was a major accident over there, certainly would engulf part of RPV. That's something of great concern to me. Uh, I am... Uh, uh, I'm interested in seeing us continue this terrific relationship that we've developed with the Trump Organization. When I first got on council, it was about as bad as bad could be, and I'm happy to report right now that it's about as good as it could be, and, and that's good, just like Tara and Ann. Uh, we've got crime issues. Uh, I think we've got a level of discourse now in the community about, about crime, the importance of it, and I think the Sheriff's Department really feels like they get a lot of support from the community. There's a, there's a level of engagement now between the Sheriff's Department and Neighborhood Watch and the Homeowners Associations and, and communities that I don't think we've seen in some time. A good part of it is due to Captain Bolden, the new Sheriff's uh, Captain down there, and he is uh, he's doing a terrific job. Well, we've got infrastructure issues. The biggest one we addressed was San, was San Ramon, uh, but we've got ongoing storm drain issues and in, in repairs. We've got infrastructure that, that's old and, and aging, and it needs to be, uh, and it needs to be addressed. We've got Hawthorne Boulevard uh, beautification. We've got the synchronization of the lights, which I'm happy to see we're going forward with, going all the way down Hawthorne Avenue. And boy, I sure wish I had more time to talk, uh, but that's a quick synopsis. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mizitich. This must be set for you. It's not tall. Is it high? It's high. Um, Our, our short-term issues that we need to address are uh, two that have or, already been mentioned. Number one, I feel that um, crime is a high priority for the city. RPV is a low-crime city, and we want to keep it that way. But that means that we must be ever vigilant and working on it. That's why last year the council took actions to increase the patrols, in RPV. One of those was the introduction of a bike patrol. Uh, being on the Regional Law Enforcement Subcommittee as a delegate from RPV, we had discussions with the Sheriff's Department and this suggestion was brought to us. We put it forth and we do have a bike patrol on Western Avenue and PV Drive South and it has done an excellent job in deterring crime. The other thing is is that we have volunteers on patrol in RPV as a result of last year council action that we brought forth to the council. The volunteers on patrol have added another 1,920 hours to the patrol hours. Total with bike patrol and the volunteers on the patrol, 2,800 hours of additional patrol time in the city of RPV. The good thing about the volunteers on patrol, it's free to you, the taxpayer. We've got 1,920 extra hours of patrol time in our city for free. The other issue um, is Ponte Vista. Again, that's, that is a uh, very, very important um, thing that we have to uh, be vigilant about. Uh, it's already been discussed. But the long term, long term is our infrastructure needs. We need to address infrastructure needs, storm drains, sewers, uh, roads, um, fixing Portuguese Bend is an important issue, probably one of the higher priority issues that we have to address here in the city. And um, those are things that we're going to have to figure out how we're going to, uh, to pay for. I'm out of time. Okay, Mr. Dida. Thank you. I think one of the first things that we need to do in this city, frankly, is to improve the control and oversight of the city council on the city operations. By this, I don't mean micromanagement. There was a level of oversight we had in the beginning that the council was 
very involved in understanding what is going on. I find now so many things are on the consent calendar that don't get fully vetted by the residents so the council can then respond to them. As the other two gentlemen said, crime is an important issue. I think we've done a lot of good things with the Sheriff's Department to improve their uh, presence in the city and try to stop that. We had a performance-based contract originally that had specific goals. Just reporting what is happening I don't think is enough. We need to set goals for the Sheriff's Department so we can encourage them to get the kind of performance we're looking for. One of the things I find that we need is earlier resident input to a lot of our projects. So many times the residents are faced with alternatives to projects after they have gone through an awful lot of staff time, consultant time in design, and the feeling is that they don't have an opportunity to really reflect on it. It's a matter of make a minor change and we'll accept it. As far as a long-term goal, I believe we have to take a look at our financial planning for the future. We need to be able to recognize the large liabilities that will loom before us. Portuguese Bend is not going to be an easy task. If we continue the path we are doing now of merely maintaining it, we end up spending an awful lot of money year after year and that cost is increasing. I think that we can set a priority program on a basis that is achievable and over time complete it. Thank you. Okay, would someone like to address further the long term or do you feel that was all inclusive? <laughs> we did shorten the long together. Okay, all right. Okay, so the next question, who do you think should set the council agenda and why? And Mr. Mizetich, if you would begin. Thank you. I'm so used to having one in front of me. I just start talking. Uh, Is this one more? Yeah. The, currently, the city council sets the council agenda. We have study sessions where we vet the, the agenda items that come forward be, be before the council. Uh, we have this every month, and we look at what is on our future agendas. And so we look at what items are on there, even on the consent calendar, even though the consent calendar has a tendency to have items either added or pulled, um, depending on, on uh, urgency items. But we have uh, the ability as a council to go ahead and set that agenda. And so if there is an issue or question on that, then we have uh, the ability, a council member has the ability to either have an island pulled or uh, question an item why it's uh, on a certain place on the future agendas. And so that is part of our current rules of procedures, and so that's what we do. Okay, we'll go continue down. Ms. Mr. Campbell. Well, by definition, the city council is in charge of the agenda, and it should be in charge of the agenda. The agenda if you're not familiar with how local government works, really is what determines what we work on. So he who sets the agenda, or she who sets the agenda, ends up controlling what the workflow is. And my opinion is, is that we can improve in that area. Number one, we should have proposed agendas sent to us in advance of when we get them right now. Too often we get future agenda items on calendars, and then when that date comes up, it just disappears and it goes away and something else takes its place. A lot of cities get their actual uh, council packets or the staff reports two weeks ahead of each meeting, so you've got more time to be able to dig in deeper and do more research, which results in better decisions. Right now, we typically get our, our council books. If you've ever seen these things, I mean, they're, they're enormous books. I mean, they can be five, 600 pages long, and, and sometimes there's, there's multiple books. We get these things on Thursday night. Well, all of us, most of us have, have jobs. I mean, Ken's lucky and, uh, and retired. I'm sure still working. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but you get these agenda packages on, on a Thursday night. If whatever your schedule is on Friday, it doesn't allow you to be able to talk to staff, talk to other people in the community that have got a particular expertise, and then the council meetings on Tuesday night, that does not lend itself to 
good decisions. And many cities do it two weeks in advance. I'd be a big proponent of that. Better data into the hands of the decision makers is going to result in better decisions. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dida. The basic job of the mayor is to conduct the meetings, sign whatever documents and represent the city as agreed to by the whole council, and to set the agenda. Now, to set the agenda with council input is certainly very appropriate and necessary. Unfortunately, as I sat in the audience and looking at some of the requests for agendas, we keep getting comments from staff, gee, that meeting is so full we can't add it. I think the council needs to take a step forward and decide which is a priority and decide how that agenda is to be conducted, not rely on staff telling them how much time is available. I think early agendas are also very appropriate, including some of the staff reports. When they come out Thursday, probably Friday, for someone in the community to look at that agenda and understand what's happening doesn't give them enough time to really put together an issue that they may be concerned with and respond to that agenda. That's compounded, in my view, by late correspondence. At the last meeting, there was late correspondence that was literally that thick that was brought to the council meeting. I challenge any member on the council to have read that to make an informed decision during the meeting. Those things should not happen. They should come out earlier so that the council has the opportunity to make a fully informed decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question I'll direct to Mr. Campbell to begin with, and then we'll go to Mr. Mizetich and Mr. Dida. It says, the, 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 someone from the audience asks, two years ago, a major topic was getting compensation data on city employees and the city manager's salary. Do we have this information yet? Um, I get, okay, that's the question. One minute or two? Two. Okay. I don't think I'll need to. This is a really timely question because just last night the council passed what took years of work and effort and collaboration in the community to all bring together. And uh, there was, there was I, I see people in the audience here right now that, that participated in that. I've been working on it for years. Uh, both of my colleagues on, on either side of us, we, we, we've all put in a lot of work on this. But what the council passed is going to be as close to pure transparency as to what employees make as you're going to find in any city in California. Let me talk about the implementation of that. While our policy is an excellent one that we just passed last night, the implementation of it is just as important because as we saw with the uh, bidding out of the banking business, which was good policy that we voted on 18 months ago, we still have not implemented that. So what we voted in last night is extremely important. I think the community is going to cheer when they actually see it. But as members of this council, you need to make sure that you vote for people that are going to hold people accountable that our policies get implemented. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mizetich. City manager makes 200 total compensation $258,135. Okay. The subcommittee at uh, on our uh, council of uh, compensation committee of Mayor Pro Tem Dehovic and Mayor Brooks uh, recently were involved in an uh, audit of the city manager's salary last year in total compensation. The audit came back. It was clean, which means that her total compensation is 258135 as it should be. And c city managers uh, in, say, like Manhattan Beach, their compensation, total compensation, 257000 I think it is, for Manhattan Beach, a smaller city. I think it's 35000 and we have 42,000 people. But I do think that what the council discussed last night was very timely. Uh, the committee is talked to the council about doing uh, um, one more year of audit on the, on the city manager, uh, arbitrary year, 
to go ahead and verify if what she was uh, paid per her contract and total compensation is what she received. And uh, that will be going forth. The, the entire city staff will have the same kind of an analysis done in a phase two type of, of uh, operation in this process. And so we will have that data as well for the total um, city staff. And that's gonna, it's gonna go further than that. I think it's gonna go contractors and even city council members who are um, you know, getting compensated. Uh, you know, we get $400 a month. So, uh, big, big bucks. So anyway, that will be all brought forth here. The council was very supportive of the subcommittee. Uh, I was supportive of it. I voted for it. Uh, it was a 5-0 vote. And we were, it's very timely that this topic is brought up because we did, uh, we did act on it last night. Mr. Dida. As I spoke at last night's council meeting, I commended the council for finally getting to this point. The template they're using is one I had proposed over two years ago and had worked diligently going through all the records of the city to compile all of that in one place. At the same time, there was some data that was not on the website that I had to get from uh, city records and combine them into that template. The template the city has is very, very similar. I would caution you, don't take the template the city has and compare it with the state controller's template. They are two different things. The state controller's template will be consistent among all cities, but it is incomplete and can be misleading unless you understand the tax code very, very well. I find, however, that they overlooked one item on the benefit side of the ledger, and that was the professional dues that the city pays for employees. I was said that that benefits the city. I would ask one question. If their employee wasn't there, would they still pay those dues? Therefore, it has to be a benefit to the employee. Of course, improving the employee's performance does benefit the city, but the employee carries that education with him wherever he goes. I would urge the council to reconsider that and put that item back in that template to make it truly complete. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question, Mr. Dida, if you'll start and we'll go down the line here. Uh, the next question asks, is the relationship between the current council and, and the new employee union improving our, uh, RPV, what will you do to help? That's a very difficult question for me because I have not been privy to any of the negotiations that I'm sure the council has, current members at least. I do remember a discussion of the memor memorandum of understanding way back at the PVIC a long time ago, and I had some questions as to where the allegiances lie. Uh, the law provides the ability for the city to ask that an audit by a professional uh, CPA be conducted of the union's budget and activities, or it can be the president. Uh, if the president is, uh, without casting any doubt on the people, you have the tendency of the fox guarding the hen house. I urge that they do that, and I was told that the union members can't afford a CPA audit on their $10 dues. This was during the MOU. That was even before negotiations had started. So I'm concerned about where they are going, how are they going to be structured so that there is a benefit and cooperation between the city and the employees and full disclosure to the residents so we know what we've got in our city hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Linda. I've got proposed right now for a future agenda item a policy that would make all of our negotiations as much as is legally possible in the state of California be conducted in public. I was visiting uh, a city where a friend of mine that I've known for about 40 years is also on the city council, and they were in the process of 
having a discussion in an open public meeting back and forth with the union representatives, with the city, and it was a good positive exchange of ideas and, and points of view on it. That is what I want. I think that we have got to have complete community uh, uh, engagement on this. We've got to be, we will be completely transparent uh, if, uh, if I get the policy agreed to as I'm going to propose it. Uh, there's something called a class and comp study. It means classification and compensation study. Having a union is actually going to give us an opportunity to have one of those done. And what that does is it compares up what the actual job requirement is to what is typically paid for that job out there in other municipal cities or even in the private sector. We need that. Some of, these, uh, uh, some of these salaries may not really be realistic for the actual job that's being done. It's possible some people aren't being paid enough. We need to know that information so that we can make the right decisions when it comes time to negotiate with the union. Right now, we are not having any negotiations. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mizetich. Okay. Thank you. Right now, we, we aren't having any negotiations. The ball is in the union's court. The city council has done its job on as far as the MOU and put that forth back to the, the union. And it, it, like I said, the ball is in their court. I think that from the council perspective, we want to have a good relationship with employees. We want to treat them fairly. Um, but we also have a fiduciary responsibility to you folks out there in the public to uh, look out for the city interests. So it's going to be somewhere where we meet in the middle and have negotiations. The unfortunate thing is we're, we're, the ball is in their court and we're waiting to hear back from them. So once we do, I think we'll, um, you know, get that ball rolling and, and you know, report back to you all um, where the things stand. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question, if we can start with Mr. Campbell, Mr. Dida, and then Mr. Mizetich. Uh, different uh, direction now. What is the status of the Portuguese Bend slide area as it affects PV Drive South? It's moving. <laughs> yes, um, I know. <laughs> it's fascinating if you get into the geology of what's going on out there. I mean, this isn't just one slide. It's, it's multiple different slides, and it's moving at different speeds. I've seen some of the, some of the geologic maps on movement of the land. There's land out there, there's portions of it that move two feet a month, sometimes three feet a month. It has a lot to do with how much it's rained, how much water is, uh, is in the ground. That is, a, that is an asymmetrical problem that we're going to have to deal with, meaning there is not one solution. Uh, the best we can do is slow it down. Uh, the fundamental part of that that everybody agrees on is removal of water from underneath the, uh, the, the ground that is making it slip. We've got dewatering wells out there. They have to be fixed or replaced on a regular basis because as the, as the ground moves, it breaks off the shafts of the, uh, of the well. So we spend a lot of money maintaining them. Uh, there's a bunch of them that do not work right now. We are going to have to move or relocate PV Drive south to the north again very soon. I mean, we did this some years ago, but periodically we have to physically demo the existing road and move it further up. There's houses that used to be on the north side of that road that are now on the south side. If you ever get a chance to get out there and go for a hike, number one, be careful, uh, because that ground is moving almost fast in some spots to be able to see it. Uh, but there's some old wrecked houses uh, uh, down there. Um, so water is, the, it, water is the key, but it's not the only solution. The good news, I'm told by the geologists, is that it will ultimately resolve itself. But that's about 250 years from now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Dinah. Thank you. We have known since 1983 the two major causes of the landslide. One is water in two characteristics, and the other is erosion of the toe of the slide due to wave action, which then reduces the buttressing. We continue to use that area as an outdoor laboratory. We keep putting wells in the part of the slide that is moving and then wonder why they fail. 21 of the 27 wells that have been installed have failed. 
That's money down the drain, literally. What really is required, in my view, is not to worry about how many different slides we have, uh, what one is moving an inch a year, another one nine feet a year. We know it's all caused by water. We need a definitive plan to go ahead and take a look at those elements that will give us the most value for our dollar and start solving the problem before we lose PV Drive South. Right now, the depression north of PV Drive South is so deep that, in effect, PV Drive South is sitting on top of an earthen dam. If that really gets waterlogged, we're going to lose PV Drive South. And the concern about losing PV Drive East is going to seem minuscule by comparison. That's the effort we need to look forward and start doing now. Okay, thank you. It's actually not a landslide. It's actually a land flow. I was told that by uh, Bob Douglas, uh, resident geologist in Portuguese Bend. It's actually the largest land flow in the western United, uh, west of the Mississippi. And it's due to water that seeps down underneath all that soil and bentonite soil, which when it becomes in contact with water becomes soap. And you, anybody knows that if they have a bar of soap and they put it on the slide, what happens? It'll go right downhill, and the more water you have, the faster it'll go. Uh, in, two th in the year 2000, we had 27 dewatering wells. Today, we only have six. Now, the council, as part of the new budget, uh, went ahead and approved for three more new watering wells and, and some rehabilitation to... Uh, some of the ones that have had their shafts sheared off due to the soil moving down beneath and, and breaking the shaft. But we need to go ahead and put those wells up high enough to where they can suck enough water out of the top of the landslide so it doesn't prevent additional water getting down lower into the landslide. That's one way of stopping it from the top. And as was mentioned earlier, you have, to, you have to protect the toe of the slide because you don't protect the toe, it'll continue to fall into the ocean. And that is uh, putting up some type of barrier that would prevent wave action from eroding the bottom of the slide. And as far as the road, we spend, we spend about four dollars to $500,000 a year on repairing that road. And it would sure would be nice to have uh, those permanent fixes in there which reduce that uh, water in the slide and thus reduce the amount of money that we have to spend on the road. And so that is part of our uh, solution that we need to move towards. Thank you. I drive it in a lot. I agree it would be yeah. nice to have yeah. it more stable. Okay, um, we'll go in reverse order this time, Mr. Dida, if you want to start. The question asks, our current city hall and surrounding area do not reflect the excellence of our community. What steps should be taken to correct the situation? If you're talking about uh, that our hall is not a Taj Mahal, I'd have to agree. Uh, it is very utilitarian. It has some problems. The question is of priorities. Do we take care of the city residents in their streets, their storm drains, their sewers, the problems we are faced with that we're solving now on San Ramon Canyon, Portuguese Bend, or do we build a nice, beautiful city hall? It is functional. It needs some repair, admittedly. But I think our priority should first be for the residents and not for the council and staff. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell. I agree with that. Uh, my regular job uh, is in the commercial real estate business, so I'm uh, a little bit familiar with how these buildings work. I pushed for, and, and the council agreed to do an engineering study on our current city council or, or, or city hall building. And the, the bones of that building are solid and certainly could use some remodeling on the outside. Uh, however, I think we have taken one step in the right direction. Is everybody been down to the, uh, to the neighborhood dog park that's down at the city hall site now? 
that has really worked out much better than any of us anticipated. I mean, that really is a fun social place uh, uh, to be, and the dogs like it too. Um, but uh, another item that I've been looking at and I've got on a proposed uh, agenda for the future is the city maintenance yard down there. We've got a maintenance yard that probably has the best view in the west of the United States of, uh, of, of the ocean. And I know that there's some other, I know there's been some talk about breaking that up and, and moving it to some other less attractive places and making that uh, area open more to the public uh, for active recreation for, uh, uh, you know, for our families and, and different organizations. Uh, real quick story, uh, I had some clients in town from China and we were driving past uh, uh, City Hall on our way to Terran Amp and one of them said, I can really tell I'm in America now when they looked at the City Hall and I thought that was an interesting comment. I said, what did you mean? And they said, well in China, the nicest building in town is always where all the government employees work. Everyone else lives in shacks. He says, in America, we can really tell that the people come first. And it, it, was, it was an interesting thing to say, but in a way, I mean, I really felt kind of proud uh, that, that they were so impressed that we put the people on top. Thank you very much. Mr. Mizitich. Yeah, I believe that the building that the city employees work in should be safe and functionable, but I'm not in favor of a big Taj Mahal type of grand plan uh, for the city hall. And especially not for the you know for the city council to hold meetings and and you know pontificate from you know some throne or something like that. In fact, this room here is right is fine for our meetings, and I'm content with working out of this room. It's just fine. I am more of a simple person myself, um, but I think the rest of the city council would uh, would agree that our priorities. Our, you know, our roads, as we talked about, just Portuguese bend, uh, infrastructure, that's where we have to go ahead and focus our, our, our energies and our talents on figuring out how we're going to address those needs to keep you in a city where you are living a uh, good quality of life. And, um, you know, as far as City Hall, again, it's got to be safe for our employees and functionable. We can do some minor minor uh, modifications of that to, to make it so, but um, I am not a proponent of, uh, you know, spending lots of money uh, for a new civic center or anything like that at this point. I think we need to address the issues that are important to you folks out there. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, the, the next question will start with you, Mr. Mizzetich, and we'll go down the road, and then we'll start with you next time, <laughs> Brian. Okay, the question asks, uh, the Sheriff's Department Sheriff's Department has done a fairly good job in protecting our community. However, having our own police department like the community of San Marino could provide superior protections. What are your thoughts on this matter? Well, quite frankly, I've served on the Regional Law Enforcement Committee for the last four years. I think our LA County Sheriff's Department has done an outstanding job in our community. I'm particularly impressed with Captain Bolin, uh, the current uh, Lamina Sheriff's Captain. He is outstanding. He has gone to residents' doors to go ahead and talk about crime prevention. That was unheard of before. And so I think he has done an excellent job. He has worked with us with the volunteers on patrol. Uh, which I said, you know, added another 1,920 hours into patrol time in our city for free. And he's worked with us in additional um, uh, initiatives such as the bike patrol. Having our own police department, I think, is a nice idea. I don't think it makes us any safer. Uh, you can ask the residents of Manhattan Beach. They've, you know, I don't know who looked at the Daily Breeze maybe two weeks ago on a Sunday, but... There was a, there's a lot of crime happening in Manhattan Beach, so I don't think having your own police department will make you safer. Also, the cost of having your own police department, it'll probably be double of what we pay right now. We pay about $4.2, $4.3 million for our sheriff's uh, protection. It'll be a lot more if we have our own police department. You're going to have... You're going to have crime lab issues. You're going to have equipment issues. You're going to have um, 
pension issues too, because they're going to be, you know, city employees. And so all those things are going to be added on top of the cost, and I don't think you're going to get more protection for it. And so I think we're doing the right thing as a contract city, contracting with the LA County Sheriff's Department, and having them do a great job in our city. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. I agree with that point of view. The LA County Sheriff's Department has, on every occasion, when we've seen a rise in a particular type of crime or intensity of it, modified their own tactics to meet it and have beaten it back down. We saw that already happen this year. We saw it happen last year. Uh, they've got a national reputation. Again, I come from a family that's got law enforcement in its background, and they do a very good job. Captain Bolin is extraordinary. Uh, I know he's just a few years away from retirement. I hope he stays on longer than that. He's got a level of engagement now with the community and, and, the, and again, Neighborhood Watch and the homeowners associations that we've never seen before. Uh, when there is an outbreak of a particular type of, say, vehicle burglaries or, or some of what they call the hot prowl crimes where burglaries happened while families were home, uh, there, there's so much talk now in the community because of this, of this new level of engagement between Neighborhood Watch and the HOAs and, and the neighbors. They also know from Captain Boland to report everything. They work off of data. I mean, I'm a data person as well. Give them all the data, the smallest crime they need to know about. They map this stuff. They track this stuff. They've got an undercover surveillance team at the LA County Sheriff's Department that's nationally recognized within law enforcement as, as being some of the best of the best. I mean, these guys are almost like, and, and gals, uh, uh, if they need to look like high school students, they're a high school student. They, are, they become part of these gangs. They, they become part of the planning. They, they, they engage with them and stop crimes before it happens. So board boots on the ground doesn't do it. I come from a military background. I volunteered for the Army after I graduated from college. And I had a number of different opportunities in the corporate world, but I thought that's where I could do uh, uh, the most good at the time. And I know firsthand that, that, that training, equipment, discipline is what makes a difference and in, in not just sheer number of, uh, of, of bodies. And that's how it is with the Sheriff's Department here. They are, they are good. We need to adequately fund them. We do. We need to be engaged. And they'll get the job done. Thank you very much. Mr. Dida. As I said earlier, we are fortunate to have a good sheriff's department. And if we really take a look at the services we get and try and compare it to what it would cost us to do that, which, by the way, was done when the city was first incorporated, and we found that the sheriff was far more cost effective. Uh, one of the things we do need to do is so that we have a better measure and better data is to add performance criteria to the functions that they provide. We could not possibly in this city afford the kind of support services we get from helicopters that do searches in our canyons and all the other support services we get from the Sheriff's Department. Um, that expense would be horrendous and it would compromise what we've developed in a way of a regional sheriff's force over the entire peninsula so we're not concerned with city boundaries except for PV estates but in the other three cities boundaries are not important it's the issue of the crime that's being committed one of the things we really need to do is educate the people on how they can harden the site lock your car doors Keep this expensive stuff out of sight in your car. Lock your front door. Lock your gate. Uh, I go down the streets and I see garage doors wide open and nobody around, and yet they all have a garage door opener. I mean, what does it take to push a button to close that door and protect your valuables? That's the biggest thing you can do in terms of safety in our city. Thank you very much. Um, I've just been advised by those who are doing the taping that they need to change tapes. So we're going to have a little uh, break now for about five minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we will reconvene then. Thank you. <coughs>